Hello, friends. This is Roy Beck, President of Numbers USA, here at our headquarters across the river from the nation's capital. Uh, we are uh, in our second webcast of a two webcast series uh, this summer. Uh, many of you will remember that in June we had Ann Coulter from the right uh, here for a very uh, uh, exciting uh, time together. And today we've got Professor Phil Cafaro from the University, uh, Colorado State University. With me is Vice President, Deputy Director, Ann Manettis. So uh, Ann Coulter uh, made a pretty passionate uh, uh, argument for lowering immigration to just a few hundred thousand a year for conservative reasons. And uh, I think soon after she talked to a uh, a billionaire some people have heard of, and he kind of picked up the, uh, picked it up. So I'm hoping that uh, that after this webcast, you will get one of the Democratic candidates to uh, sort of step up on the immigration issue as well. You know, I'd, I'd be happy to have Bernie or Hillary uh, talk to me about the issue. Okay, well, you're available. So we'll send uh, those of you who have connections with the Democratic candidates, be sure to let them know. Uh, the professor is, is uh, available. Uh, well, uh, as an author myself, I know that it's very important for you to know that this book is not only good for you, <laughs> but it's fun to read. Okay, that's it's a good read. So that's that, you have to get that out of the way first. One of the things I thought was uh, was especially uh, good about it and kind of uh, surprising was that uh, a professor of philosophy. I remember my professor of philosophy, and I saw so I was ex expecting a lot of Descartes, and uh, I don't think did you mention. <laughs> Not that I recall. I, I bring in Henry Thoreau. Yeah, well, that's okay. That's that's uh, that's easier. But um, you have a lot of just personal vignettes in the book. You know, it's like uh, uh, interviewing like a an illegal alien worker and, and contractors working on your house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and those kind of stories, uh, you know, really kind of bring everything down to earth, kind of on a local level. You've lived a few localities. Well. Well, um, I've lived in, I was born in, in New York City, the center of the universe, and uh, subsequently lived in Chicago, uh, lived in and studied in Athens, Georgia for five years. Which uh, Anne did as well, although at an earlier age. Right, right. Uh, I spent time in Boston, and for the past 15 years, I've been in Fort Collins, Colorado. So, uh, and that, that comes through in the book. It's very good because you have, you reflect different regional cultures in the way that they look at, uh, at some of these issues. Uh, I, uh, I, I guess I did find, I have to say, that a little bit of the first part of the book, for those of you who are uh, uh, long-time Numbers USA members, you know uh, lots of this information about the numbers. You know, our people, uh, you know, I went into this expecting, well, understandably, I'm going to know most of this. Sure. And so, you know, I kind of... I did kind of speed read through a little bit of it, and then, boy, I mean, pretty soon, I was uh, I was reading every word. Uh, so it was, you know, I, I learned a lot, and I, you know, I think I, I enjoyed most just the getting into the the philosophy, uh, the logic, and the, the the ethics of these issues. You wrote this book; it says a progressive argument for reducing immigration in the United States. I assume you didn't write this with the idea of, of convincing conservative Republicans. You had a different audience in mind. No, that's right. I mean, I think there's a very vigorous discussion about immigration issues on the right. We've seen it in the last couple months in the presidential um, uh, race among Republicans. The discussion among progressives, people on the left, in contrast, is very anemic. And I find that, that a lot of times the best thing I can do when I'm talking to progressive politicians or progressive groups about this is simply to start with some of the basics. Talk about some of the numbers that a lot of the people listening to this will already be familiar with. The, uh, I think, and you pulled out a, a, a sort of a paragraph in the book that you thought really encapsulated the whole book. Right, I did. Page 188. For those of you with your books in front of you, turn to page 188. We're seeing the second and well, third verses. But as you were saying, it's well into the book that I this statement um, caught my attention, but I think it captures the central tenet of, of the book, maybe. It says, if we refuse to reduce immigration, then we must accept the economic, demographic, and environmental consequences of continued mass immigration, which together ensure the failure of the progressive political agenda in the United States. So to me, that really kind of summed up the whole book. But maybe you could say some more about that for the 
viewers who haven't read. Sure, read the sure. Book. Well, uh, people are going to define progressivism somewhat differently, uh, different people. Uh, for me, the core of progressivism is really a, an economic core. Uh, as a progressive, uh, longtime democratic and environmental activist, as a progressive, um, I care uh, above all about creating a society that limits economic inequality among its members. I want to create a society where workers, productive economic citizens, uh, are able to enjoy the fruits of their labor. Uh, I don't want a society where it's sort of uh, dog eat dog and the stronger wins everything. So to my mind, uh, a more economically egalitarian society uh, is really the core of, of progressivism. Uh, I'm also a longtime environmentalist, so the creation of an ecologically sustainable society is also very important. I mean, if we want to pass on a robust nation to our children and grandchildren and, and still have, uh, have it work for them, we have to create a sustainable society. So for me, really, that's how I define progressivism. And what moved me to write this book was a sense that current immigration policies are moving us further and further away from those progressive political goals. So on the economic front, we're bringing in uh, somewhere near a million and a quarter immigrants annually into the country, primarily um, people with less skills, less education. And so we're really flooding labor markets for poorer Americans. Um, and driving down their wages. So immigration is really helping create, year after year, a less egalitarian society. But I'm sure that people say, well, there's a lot of reasons that that's happening. Oh yeah, that's true, that's true. And I, I don't want to say that immigration is, is the answer to, to everything. Uh, but it's, it's a big part of the problem, especially if you wade through some of the studies that economists have done showing that as you increase uh, the labor force rapidly within certain sectors of the economy, that clearly drives down wages. There are all other ways that it does it as well. It makes it harder to unionize workers. Uh, it, it, uh, in our context in the United States, more workers are illegal and so they're not in a position to defend their rights. So there are a whole number of ways in which mass immigration makes it harder uh, for us to, to start to close that income and wage gap. Then from the environmental side, um, I've been working on environmental issues for about 25 years now in different parts of the country. And over and over again, what I've found is our environmental problems tend to be driven by a rapidly growing population. And it's very difficult for us to get a handle on them, even when we, when we try to do the right thing, put in place laws to reduce pollution, put in place efficiency so we use water and energy more more efficiently. Instead of using those savings to protect the environment, what we've tended to do is just use them to further accommodate growth. So we're running very hard environmentally just to stand still. So um, after 20 or so years working in politics, working on environmental issues, trying to, uh, trying to make my communities better places, I decided really the best thing I could do politically was, was to try to alert my fellow progressives to the importance of this issue for all the other things that we're working on. You know, I, and it's important when reading this book to know that that's exactly who you're writing to, and yet I don't think you have to be a progressive to uh, draw a lot of things in here that, you, that are really helpful. Uh, you know, if you're not a progressive, there's going to be some positions you take on non-immigration non things that a non-progressive is going to disagree with because that's what's the difference between a progressive and somebody else. But uh, I think that for people who are conservatives, for example, uh, to, to, to really get into the, to your uh, thought on progressivism and to see how sometimes the value that you're projecting is probably not much different than a conservative value. Uh, in terms of like being conservative, I'm going to you know I'm going to argue for the conservatives in the audience. Being conservative does not mean that you want uh, uh, workers to be poorly paid and poorly treated. Uh, it's just that it tends not to be what's up front as their as their primary goals. Sure, and you know it's nice when people from the left and the right can come together on some political goals. 
I think the polling shows that, that if you leave aside the political elites and just look at everyday voters, uh, everyday workers, you'll find uh, a lot of agreement on the need to enforce immigration laws, for instance, and often on the need to reduce certain categories of immigration. Is, are our slides working? I know I jumped way ahead. Sorry about that. Throw up. There, there, you, you had three principles that you put in the book. You've, you've stated them, but let's get them up on the screen. But the first one, you, you say there's three principles, that immigration policies should be reformed to increase wages for poor Americans. I mean, it's very direct. It's not a big, high, pollutant idea. Increase wages for poor Americans. Secondly, reduce economic inequality throughout society. And third, uh, they should be reformed to make ecological sustainability possible. And that gets to your favorite paragraph again, which is that you're basically making the argument in this book, none of these are possible if, if we continue the immigration policies we have. That's right. Uh, it's, it's very clear that uh, bringing in hundreds of thousands, uh, over a million new workers every year is driving down wages for Americans. And um, now, progressives are often uncomfortable with the idea of reducing immigration. We, we have this idea that, that we want to help the world. We want to help poor people around the world. I argue in the book that, that that's good that we have that concern for poor people in other countries but that mass immigration is not uh, a good form of foreign aid, principally because uh, it's a form of foreign aid. It's almost as if we're just taxing poor people in America to help poor people in other places. Um, that's not the most efficient or fair way to, to do what we want to do. Well, and it, sorry, <laughs> relatively recent history. I mean, you mentioned 20 years ago. That was when the two federal commissions in the 90s came out. And made immigration recommendations based on the same principles that you've identified. You know, the Jordan Commission was very much basing their recommendations on fairness for workers and concern for that. And the That's right. Clinton Sustainability Commission was recommending, they made a number of recommendations, but their immigration recommendations were based much in what you're talking about. So in somewhat recent history, this wasn't completely foreign to progressives. And That's right. And if you go back <laughs> even, even further in, in 1970, let's say, certainly environmentalists uh, were very much on board with the idea that stabilizing America's population was absolutely key to dealing successfully with our environmental right. problems. So um, yeah, it's a very interesting story how environmentalists, how economic progressives over time have, have lost sight of the importance of population issues. Well, I, I think you get a very important part of the book, which uh, I think people of all ideologies will appreciate, is you really get in this question about our borders moral. And um, among progressives, uh, there are progr it seems to me that there are progressives who believe that national communities are necessary for progressive values. And then there are progressives who don't believe that that national communities and borders are really moral. We really find the same thing among conservatives. Basically, that's a divided division with globalist libertarians, who same kind of thing. Right. I, I want to throw a couple of slides up here from your book. Uh, you, know, you said there's, there's a nagging sense among many progressives that borders are morally irrelevant. Um, and that there's a, a political philosopher, I have to work on his name, uh, Kukathas. Chandran Kukathas, yes. yes. Political philosopher Convin Kukathas, who um, he gives what he calls a liberal egalitarian argument for open borders. And, and what he says is egalitarianism demands uh, that the Earth's resources be distributed as equally as possible, and that one particularly effective mechanism is freedom of movement. Um, and you note it, you say in the book, this is a very powerful uh, argument for many progressives. Uh, and it relies on the common thought what right do I have? Uh, to shut the door on people who are just as good as I am and who through no fault of their own have been born into less happy circumstances. I, I can't imagine that any of us have not heard a, a neighbor, a friend say that. Sure. Uh, and not always just a liberal. I, I mean, it, we, it just comes out of just kind of a sense of generosity, maybe a sense of guilt that, that a person lives in the United States and is lucky. Uh, in fact, uh, Kasich, Governor Kasich just made a statement like this uh, today or yesterday uh, about, I think he was, he was chastising um, uh, Laura Ingram, uh, mm -hmm. saying, 
you know, look, we ought to just realize how lucky we are to be in the United States, and we shouldn't be trying to keep other people from having the great fortune we have. So here's a, here's a Republican saying the same kind of thing. It's like, it's, it's, just, it's just not right to hold people out. So you made a comment about how it may not be the best for other countries, but really, how can you make a moral argument, especially from a progressive case, for having national communities that put the members of your national community ahead of people in other countries? Well, I mean, that's a great question, and it's one of the most uh, difficult questions that I, I tackle in the book, um, because it, it involves uh, just a number of, of questions about what are our real moral responsibilities in the world, and what are our, what's practically possible in terms of, of uh, political progress. So. Um, I think for, for a typical progressive, that's the strongest argument against reducing immigration. We know that uh, by allowing mass immigration, we allow people to come to this country, make better lives for themselves and their families. We feel good about that, as we should, and, um, and we don't sometimes see that we have any right to, to limit those opportunities for other people. So how do we deal with that? Well, I think you have to start by saying there's, there's really no free lunch in all this. So, yes, mass immigration has benefited tens of millions of immigrants in, in recent decades. But as progressives, we've, we've also seen that wages have stagnated and for many Americans declined over that same period. And there's a clear connection between those things. So um, you can't necessarily put in place an immigration policy that's going to benefit people everywhere in the world and also sustain and improve economic conditions for, for workers in the United States. Similarly, um, from the environmental front, we, we see that um, we're bumping up against limits. We're bumping up against limits in terms of how much energy we use, how much carbon we're putting in the atmosphere, uh, how much water we have. So, if you continue to bring in tens of millions of people in, in the coming decades, you're just going to have to pave over a lot more land in the United States. You're going to have to pave over farmlands and, uh, and wildlands. You're going to have to take more water out of the rivers, and that means other species get driven off the landscape and in some cases driven extinct. So the point is that there are trade-offs in all these things. And once you bring that into the equation, um, it, gets, uh, it gets a little more complicated. As progressives, we should care about poor people overseas, but we should find ways to help them that don't sort of take it out of the hides of our own poor American workers. And I also would say that, that as Americans in a, a, an overpopulated world, we have a responsibility now to work to create a sustainable society. So those are the things that I think should be, be driving our, our goals in immigration policy. We use the term hard choices throughout your book and that they're winners and losers, um, which right. speaks to that. But I, I like the fact that you acknowledge it's not an easy, these are not easy decisions, but progressives need to think about the consequences of what they're supporting. And, and we also have to think realistically about the values of nation states and borders. I mean. Today we live in a world, I, I'm a professor, so I type in email messages or Skype with people around the world every week talking about things. There's a sense in which a lot of us now feel that we're part of a global community. But when you look at what we've been able to achieve to create justice for workers, uh, racial justice, when you look at our environmental improvements over the past 50 years, those are primarily achievements that have been achieved within the framework, the political framework, of the United States. That's the arena where we can create just and sustainable societies. And before we sort of erase borders and imagine that we're still going to be able to preserve a lot of the good things that we have, um, we, we need to take a, a hard look at that. You note in here that uh, admission and exclusion are at the core of communal independence uh, and self-determination. Uh, the idea of self-determination, uh, self-determination, I kind of remember that, that term really coming up from the United Nations, a lot of, lot of international talk about the importance of self-determination all over the world. This is not about the United States, 
This is, this is about the end of colonialism, that every people have the right to self-determination. But as you say, how can, you, how can there be such a thing as self-determination if you don't have a community that's defined by exclusion? That's right. I mean, and, and again, we might wish that away, but in the same way that we sort of understand that creating good lives for ourselves and our families involves you know, for many of us, having a house and a yard, and, and you know, we let some people in, we have guests, uh, but we don't necessarily let the guests stay forever, and we don't necessarily want 20 people living in our house, we might be content with four or five. Um, in, in the same way, in order to create the kind of societies we want, we have uh, a right, and I would even say a responsibility, to talk about things like what a reasonable level of, of immigration is. And, and also, I think it's past time for Americans to start asking just how many people can we support within our boundaries for the long haul? What is a sustainable population for the United States? And you suggest that, uh, that we've kind of reached a limit so far. I mean, you talk about the fact that we already are, have you know, uh, uh, destroyed some species, many species, destroying habitats. <laughs> Uh, I think the next uh, slide here so mentions that, that this uh, Kukathos, uh, that he has this value in which uh, there's no value to the earth beyond what humans take from it. There was a kind of a, he was making fun of Australians for being concerned about their environment and saying, well, we can't have a, a big immigration population program because he's just, you know, it's like that was just kind of frivolous to be doing it. And then you, you go ahead and, and uh, you said with open borders, uh, the interests of non-human nature would be sacrificed completely to the interest of people. Um, and then finally, this uh, kind of tough one, you say, I ask, how many other species must we drive extinct before you would agree that we have taken too much? <laughs> it is, you know, is anybody who's, uh, maybe right now they say, I, I think the amount of extinction we have going on right now is fine. But is, is there any limit to that? That seems to be what you're suggesting. Yeah, and, and again, people are gonna have different views about this, but for me, um, I take very seriously the idea that we have certain responsibilities toward the other species that we share the landscape with. Uh, I think uh, it, it's fine for people to take, it's fine for people to make our lives on this landscape. It's not so fine when we just look at the whole world as natural resources for our use and try to maximize the sheer numbers of people and our own wealth. I mean, I think. I think we owe something to other species. We owe them, and, and under the Endangered Species Act, we owe something to other species. We've committed as a nation, 40 years ago now, to preserve sufficient habitat and resources for all native species to remain on the landscape in the United States. I think that's a morally and, and in terms of creating the kinds of society, the kind of society we want, that's a wonderful thing to goal to try to achieve. But if we take that seriously, we just can't keep increasing our population forever. You do, uh, you have a section in here that's called objections, which is a lot of fun, because uh, I know that, you know, when I'm writing my books, or when I did write my books, uh, don't write books anymore, I would, you know, when I'm writing, I'm kind of anticipating the criticism as I'm writing. This one, you, you just put a, you have a whole chapter in which you just anticipated their criticism of the early part and take it on head on. It's, it's very good. And one of the objections I think you anticipated was that somebody say, well, you know, that's a bunch of uh, uh, green earth shoe, uh, touchy feely stuff. On, but, you know, it's like human beings are the most important thing. You know, there's no question that lots of voters, lots of Americans are going to be primarily anthropocentric, mm -hmm. not ecocentric. So what you just said, it's like, you know, people say, well, that'd be nice, but if, when it comes to, ch to between people and Walmart. some snail, yeah, or, yeah, that's right, snail dart or whatever, you know, I'm choosing people. But you, you anticipate that with an argument about it really, every, everything you do in terms of change of, of saving species and habitats today is actually about people in terms of the future. That is, that is whatever you, allowed to destroy today, what are we allowed to be destroyed today, we have taken from all future generations of human beings. Uh, not just Americans, but, you know, we have 45 million visitors a year, legal visitors a year in this country. Part of why they visit is because of the, of, that we have some special things in this country. Yep. Uh, 
a lot of that starts to disappear if we uh, double our population in a century. That's true. I mean, even if I make a pretty, the strongest case I can make in this book that we should care about the rest of the non-human world. But let's say you don't buy that and all you care about is people. Um, you're still concerned with the kind of lives your kids and grandkids will be able to live. And you're absolutely right. You know, a world in which they can't experience any wild nature is a world that is really impoverished for humans. And, you know, even if you follow Chandran Kukavas and say, well, I don't care about any of that. The world is just people and natural resources. Even then, I think you're going to reach a point, and we might have reached it already, where adding more people isn't in people's interests. Because there's such a thing as too many people, even if all you care about is people. I mean, there's a reason why when you go into a theater, there's a little sign up that says you can have 90 people in here safely. And lately, with climate change, with increased acidification of the oceans, with a number of these global issues, we seem to be seeing some evidence that the earth is full up. So it's really time for those of us who are just focused on people and for those of us who care about nature to come together and to think about some limits to human numbers. You, uh, you have bitten the bullet. I mean, you're, it'd be kind of bad if, if somebody wrote a book like this didn't sort of name a number. <laughs> How many is too many? And you actually do it. At, at the beginning of the book, you give us an idea, and then you, uh, you tell us what you think we should do. Um, let's throw up his... Uh, his policy uh, suggestions of what, what it would be a progressive, what would be progressive immigration policies? Number one would be to, uh, and this gets right at it, what, what would it be to cut legal immigration from uh, running about 1.1 million a year uh, to 300,000 per year? And in a way, that's the, over, that's the overarching recommendation, I would say. The most, most important, uh, as you know, as, as most of the people listening to this know, most immigration into the United States is legal immigration. And so if you're concerned about total numbers, uh, you need to be concerned about the level of legal immigration. The current levels are much too high. They're flooding labor markets for poorer Americans. They're driving uh, tremendous population growth. The United States is currently growing uh, much faster than almost any other developed nation. So by cutting back from 1.1 million currently to about 300,000 annually, We'd relieve a lot of that pressure on poorer Americans. Uh, and very importantly, over the next couple decades, our population would gradually level off. So to my mind, that's the most important recommendation in the book. So we're going to go backwards on the uh, slide there and, and look at uh, the, 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 uh, the, the Florida Democrats. We had a poll of Florida Democrats this year to see how Democrats feel about this. In Florida, uh, it's, we found in the poll, 55% of Democrats say that the government should reduce immigration to slow population growth. Now, we look at Democrats, we know not all Democrats are progressives, mm -hmm. but most progressives are Democrats. True. And uh, so it's interesting, 55%, 33% said we should keep immigration and population growth the same. Only 4% say we should increase immigration and population growth. Um, and then, then we have another poll, uh, of Democratic voters nationwide. This was taken the day after the uh, election last year. These are, these are found people who said they actually voted the day before. Uh, and uh, given the millions of Americans who are having trouble finding jobs, do you think it is mostly fair or mostly unfair to bring in over one million legal immigrants each year who are given the right to also look for jobs? 50% of Democrats who voted says mostly unfair. 38% mostly unfair, 12% unsure. Now. Uh, a person could definitely argue that that question is kind of a leading question. It's, it's not asking people what they think off the top of their head. It's basically saying, what would happen if you actually went to voters and talked in this way? Because what you say in your book is, these really are the choices. Yeah. We, have, we have millions of Americans who say they would like to have a job, can't find a job. We're, bring, we're giving lifetime work permits over a million foreign citizens a year, does that seem fair or unfair? I don't think that's an unfair question or unfair thing to ask uh, voters and for politicians to ask them. And what we see is Democrats are not overwhelming. The Republicans, there's no question. Republicans are much more concerned about that uh, in the polling. Um, 
But what do we see in terms of uh, the, the Democratic presidential candidates? Uh, <laughs> well, they're much more like the, the elites of the Democratic Party, right, who seem to believe this is a, a way if we encourage or if we support more immigration, we're supporting more voters, they'll come in and vote Democratic. But that's right, and, and that's one of the most frustrating things for me in, in dealing with this. You know, I've, I've talked to politicians in my own state of Colorado, uh, state senators and state Republicans who, who I've worked with on other issues, uh, state senators and state representatives, uh, Democrats, who I've worked with on issues, and they get these points that I'm making in the book. They, they understand that we're not going to preserve Colorado's environment with an endlessly growing well, population. So, they, so they, they, privately, they're not really pushing back with you and say, no, that, was, that would be, that'd be immoral. That would, goes against our principles. No, no. I mean, they, they get it. They understand that there's a cost to this immigration. And even on, in some instances that I'm thinking of, uh, they'd like to support uh, a bill to reduce immigration. But then you get into the specifics of it, and the message comes back, well, no, the, the word from the state party is we're, we're not taking that position. And I think there's a certain amount of political opportunism going on. I mean, Democrats know that uh, most immigrants tend to vote Democratic, and they've gotten comfortable presenting themselves as the party that cares about immigrants, as opposed to those terrible Republicans who, who don't care. And so that's the way they play it. And um, I think there's political opportunism there. Again, as I said earlier, it's also connected up to a genuine concern with poor people in other places. Uh, so I don't want to say it's completely opportunistic. But it, it is very striking that when you move from the level of Democratic voters and rank and file Democrats up to the elite policymaking politician level of things, uh, you find a lot more support for continuing and even increasing mass immigration. As your poll numbers suggest, there really is essentially no support for increasing immigration um, among the, the populace. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, you know, 33 percent is still a lot of people say keep it the same. But when it comes to actually supporting what the Democratic, the Democratic Party's policy, almost a litmus test right now for almost every member, Democratic member of Congress is that we should double legal immigration. Yep. It's, it's not just the amnesty, it's double legal immigration. Um, that's, that's, that's really powerfully out of sync with, with what the polling would show where, Dem where Democrats actually feel. When, you, when, when, you mentioned in the beginning the uh, vigorous debate among the Republican candidates right now on immigration, whether or not it's entirely informed is sort of a different, that's for another webcast, but um, among the Democrats we haven't seen as much discussion, but um, some of the viewers probably saw the Ezra Klein interview with Bernie Sanders, and I think that was a bit shocking to a lot of progressives. On the other hand, well, perhaps it was just shocking to the elites, maybe not so much to the voters, but essentially Ezra Klein was challenging him, um, Sanders, saying, well, shouldn't we, you know, have open borders, basically, with assuming that Sanders was on board with that. Yeah, and, if, if you're an international humanitarianism, how could you really hold anybody right. down? And because I will misquote it, I, I printed the quote, and so Ezra Klein was saying, well, it would make a lot of global poor richer, wouldn't it? And Bernie Sanders said, it would make everybody in America poorer. You're doing away with the concept of a nation state, and I don't think there's any country in the world that believes in that. And then he goes on to talk about how it lowers wages and this and that, but he ends with um, something I thought was interesting. Sanders says, I think from a moral responsibility, we've got to work with the rest of the industrialized world to address the problems of international poverty but you don't do that by making people in this country even poorer. Let's just point out, I mean, this is just not any Democratic candidate. This is the candidate that's got progressives excited mm -hmm. about the upcoming presidential election. And he's an honest guy, Bernie Sanders. I mean, he, people kind of understand that he says what he thinks. He's not uh, afraid to, to stake out strong controversial positions. Um, he understands that Flooding labor markets drives down wages and makes it harder to organize workers. He, he called it a Koch brothers proposal. I he think. said that, <laughs> that, that's the kind of proposal that the Koch brothers would, would right. support. So um, yeah, I, uh, I had coincidentally just put a Bernie 2016 sticker on my car a few days before that. So I was, I was you, very, very happy to hear that. But that statement's actually against, I mean, he was sort of just, he was slammed by the, by the most progressive publications in the country for saying this, yeah. for saying something that really 
the vast majority of Americans think it's just logical. So it's, it shows how, and he himself has been unwilling. You know, he, he, voted for, he voted for a bill uh, in 2013 that would have doubled legal immigration. Now, that's right. He, uh, and at the, he, was, he voted against the massive increase in 07. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in 13, he, uh, he, kind of, he kind of got bought off with a, there was a provision that I think they put money in to, uh, uh, to provide for some more training and some help for, stu for, for young people who might be hurt by the higher levels. But I think that was a case where he, just, he was just almost forced into the, uh, to this position by the Democratic Party. It's very, very difficult for a Democrat, uh, for, for a Democratic office holder at the national level and for a progressive at the national level to say almost anything you say in this book. That's what I think. Yeah, I think it's true. And, and you know, maybe he would have voted against that bill in 2013 if he wasn't seriously thinking about running for president now. Uh, because again, uh, that really has become a litmus test. I think the answer here is not to say, well, Democrats, to be a real Democrat, you have to coalesce around these seven points that, that I say in my book. I think the answer for us is to have that vigorous discussion. I mean, that's why I wrote the book, just to get people understanding some of the trade-offs. Well, I think, I think those three principles we had at the beginning are ones that would probably be easier for moving uh, uh, progressives that aren't on our side. I mean, there's, no, don't get me wrong, lots of progressives are on our side, lots of progressives in our organization, progressive watching right now, but I'm talking about at the national level the progressives at the national level are very few and far between who are really taking this on. But I think to move people, we start with those principles, which are principles that I think are ones that are difficult. If you really pin a progressive down and say, do you think that immigration policy uh, should be done without regard to what it does to wages, without regard to what it does to sustainability, it's, it's, it seems like that's hard. Now, a little harder for them to deal with your specifics. And let's throw your specifics, we'll get specifics back up. Uh, because you you have some very clear specifics, which are not exactly not not, speci not exactly numbers USA specifics, but they're uh, they're very interesting. So the first one was uh, to cut legal immigration from 1.1 million uh, to 300 thousand per year. Uh, the second one was eliminate the poll factors, reduce legal immig illegal immigration by mandating e-verify for all new hires, and and that's I mean that's that's a very bipartisan. Uh, kind of position, as you said, from way back. Yeah, I mean, people will disagree strongly about how many people to let in legally each year, but pretty much reasonable people will say, whatever number we choose, then we have to do something to try to make that number stick. So uh, we have a, a wonderful uh, program, E-Verify, it works. I think something like 20 million uh, new job hires were run through it last year. So this is something that's up and running. It could easily be made mandatory for all new hires. I, I would just add that in addition to that, uh, I would like to see much stronger enforcement efforts made towards employers beyond employees, uh, stronger enforcement efforts with stiff fines and even jail sentences for employers who repeatedly violate uh, immigration laws and hire people illegally. That's another thing that we really haven't tried in this country in a serious way. We've had laws, but, but uh, President Reagan, President H.W. Bush, President Clinton, President W. Bush, President Obama, none of them have enforced the laws against employers, yeah. uh, except in a minor kind of way. Uh, uh, absolutely, that'd make a difference. And then third, the third point, you link, you say part of a progressive immigration policy is to address the push factors. Rework trade agreements, a better and better target development aid to uh, people uh, so they can live, live be better lives and rein in population growth in their own countries. So even though maybe many people say, well, that's not an immigration policy, to you, you think a progressive recognizes that there is this issue of how, how are we helping people in other countries. So you don't just say immigration is not the best way or a good way to help people in other countries. You say part of our immigration policy is we are going to help people in other countries. Yeah, we can we can devote more resources to that, and we can be much smarter in how we we devote those resources. So, uh, for instance, an awful lot of our foreign aid, if you look at the numbers, comes as military aid, uh, aid for big uh, dam projects and and big uh, 
uh, environmentally destructive projects. Uh, a lot of our agricultural aid is primarily uh, devoted towards intensifying and industrializing agriculture in other countries, and that winds up throwing a lot of poor farmers off the land. So we could, we could be more generous and more intelligent about our foreign aid. You mentioned that I, I do a lot of interviews, did a lot of interviews for this book, and in talking to immigrants, it was really striking to me how often they would say, you know, I would have loved to have stayed in my home country. I just couldn't make it work there. Either things were too corrupt or there were no jobs or whatever it was. So I think if we can begin to address those push factors, it would really be better all the way around. The difference, I guess, between your uh, prescriptions and often what we hear from Democrats is that they will generally say, yes, they will agree with that. We, if we can just solve the push factors, we can solve this. But you recognize that the time it would take to, to, to solve the push factors, we'd have tens of millions more people in this country. You've got to deal with the, the pull as well. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and then the next one, we're not going to take time on it because we're running out of time, but progressives would be a little surprised to see this, but you do call for ending birthright citizenship. And, and there's very practical reasons that that, that fits in. Uh, the next one, number five, is uh, is even more interesting, and that is you believe a, a progressive policy of immigration would give carefully targeted amnesty, particularly children brought to the U.S. at an early, early age. Um, and in light of everything else you're saying here, you're still saying that nonetheless we ought to give lifetime work permits to certain number, certain millions of these of these people who've come here illegally, uh, even though I assume you'll say that, I mean, their presence is harmful to American workers. How, how do you justify that? Well, I mean, again, there are trade-offs any way you go. And, and I think we, we've very clearly seen after the amnesty in 1986 and some of the subsequent ones, um, those amnesties really did incentivize further illegal immigration. And so there's a part of me, I mean, I thought really hard and, and went back and forth on this particular issue. <clears throat> and there's a part of me that would love to say, look, no amnesties, you broke the law. Uh, part of getting a workable system in place is to end that. On the other hand, um, we have people in this country who have been in the country for decades and have been working. They've become contributing members of society. Uh, their paychecks have been taxed. I think we owe some of those people citizenship. Uh, I also think when you talk about um, children uh, who were born in this country to illegal parents, I think you can make a case that to keep those families together, um, some of them, some of the parents Do you think should, it makes a difference how long they've been here? Well, it does. Be, and partly it's just because you have, to set, you have to set some kind of parameters. In the 2013 Senate bill, it was basically something like, well, if you've been here, you know, if you came here a year ago or, or earlier, and essentially almost all illegal uh, immigrants would have been amnestied in. Uh, that's, that's just completely unworkable and a huge incentive towards further illegal immigration. So I would tend to try to find a way to uh, amnesty the, the people who've been here the longest to keep families together where possible. Um, Realizing, though, that any sort of amnesty is, to some degree, incentivizing further illegal immigration. So how, do you, how, do you, how do you cut? If you were to do that, if the government were to do that, mm -hmm. what, how, how do we try to ensure that we don't have another 11 million come in? Do you think that your, your other parts of your, your proposals would do that? I think uh, mandatory E-Verify would, would just be a huge step forward, because I think that is a workable program. I think it's proven to be a strong deterrent in sectors where it's, it's become uh, regularly used. I also think um, it would be hugely effective if the employers who are making money off this situation had to pay a penalty when they broke the law. So um, I guess one way to say it is I'm not looking for the solution that would maximize dealing with Ill illegal immigration. I'm looking for a solution which would be acceptable and, and strong in that, but at the same time make some concessions towards humanitarian concerns. Is part of what's driving you in this point that you, practically speaking, you can't, it's hard for you to imagine enough Democrats 
going along with with a, with cutting legal immigration, you know, the way you want it, the way you feel like it needs to uh, uh, do, unless you've got some amnesty in there. Yeah, I mean, I can see that as being part of a grand bargain for sure, and and that was part of my thinking. Another part, as I've said, is you know, I, I interviewed a lot of people, I interviewed a lot of illegal immigrants, and. Um, you know, I got to say, some of their stories really got to me, and um, so, so, so you really are a, a bleeding heart liberal. Uh, I mean, you, you, I you, am. You I don't am. just pretend to be as a book on your book tour. <laughs> That's right. But you know, my heart bleeds for illegal workers. My heart bleeds for native-born American workers who are seeing their wages erode, and and my heart bleeds for all those animals uh, that that uh, are getting driven out of their homes. Well, I'm bleeding all over the place here, Roy. What can I say? <laughs> so, and, you know, and finally, you, you, you suggest that, that a progressive immigration policy would always, would revisit immigration policy so we don't have something that's an automatic pilot year after year. Like uh, right one thing I didn't put on here was that you, you actually call for a moratorium on all emerge, uh, in, the, in the short term, a moratorium on all legal immigration that's, 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 unless it's an emergency type immigration until uh, until uh, our unemployment rate is below 5% and stays there for three years. So in that sense, that's a pretty, that's a very strong uh, proposal, stronger than one that Numbers USA has, uh, has proposed. Uh, well, uh, it's been a, a great to, to uh, have you discuss uh, this book, which of course has so much more in it. Uh, I thought I, I kind of wanted to, uh, to end on uh, just your example of... Uh, the first time that every person who has ever appeared before a local zoning commission or a planning commission, city council, on an environmental issue, a quality of life issue, um, to try to sort of hold back massive changes, has had the experience that you had the first time you experienced it, and then you've just had it every over and over and over again. T tell that story and why, why, why it relates so much to, uh, to why people on a local level will never have peace until a, an immigration policy like you're descri describing happens. I start the discussion of environmental issues by talking about the issue that made me an environmentalist 25 years ago. I was living in Athens, Georgia. And uh, I really fell in love with, with the landscape down there. I, I would float along the Oconee River in my canoe and bird watch along the river. And I learned, uh, the local Sierra Club there learned, about proposals to build a big dam on that river, flood about 12 miles of the stretch of the river north of, of Athens. And um, so we fought that. And you know we did all the usual things. I, I took reporters in my canoe along the river to show them what would be lost and these kind of things. And one of the things we did is we weighed in on the environmental impact statement that was being made to justify this, this dam. And I still remember that sinking feeling that I had reading the start of this environmental impact statement and reading the population projections for northeast Georgia for the 30 or 40 years to come and thinking, are we really going to grow this fast? Uh, and you know, we, we tried to argue in all the usual ways against building that dam, but as soon as they could appeal to these Census Bureau figures for what our population was going to be, the case for the dam was mostly made. More people, they're going to need more water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And since then, um, over and over again, I've, I've worked on ski area expansion issues in New England. I've worked for I, I've worked on, uh, most recently, another dam proposal that we're trying to fight in central Colorado. Um, again and again, when you see the facts and figures being used to justify these projects, these harmful projects, population projections are, are right out front there. And what it's really brought home to me is they, we're sort of spitting into the wind if we're just going to continue to deal with the symptoms of a growing population and never come to the place of saying, we really have to stabilize our population. Um, I'm, I'm tired of losing. I've been losing as an environmentalist for 25 years. I want to start winning. And I want, you know, I want more water in the Cache Laputa River 50 years from now when my grandkids are living there, not less. I want, I want, uh, them to be able to enjoy the same beautiful natural areas that I can go with my kids today. 
And, and the good part is American citizens have decided to stabilize our population. We've chosen to have right around two kids per, per family. On average. On average. And uh, so we've chosen to stabilize our population. It's, it's the elites who've chosen to override the populace on that. So I think it's time that environmentalists and economic progressives both started to address the basic factors that are driving some of these trends that we're trying to fight. We've been dealing with symptoms long enough. Let's, let's try to make some hard choices, create just and sustainable societies, and I think reducing immigration is, is a part of that. Well, of course, as we know, all the population projections are based on population growth that the only long-term factor is immigration. Because as you say, since Americans have averaged uh, only about two kids per woman in this country since 1972, mm -hmm. that, it, that cannot cause long-term population growth. So all long-term population growth is immigration driven. You say, I guess I'll finish on uh, mentioning a, a, a quote you have here as you say, I contend that paying to sustainability or earnest expressions of our strong environmental feelings are merely hot air when coupled with a blithe acceptance of the doubling or tripling of America's population. That's, a, that's, that's laying down the line. And uh, I know we're glad to, we're glad to see, see you lay down the lines. Uh, a, a, a parting shot at, at I mean, we've been kind of, we've been a little too easy on it. for something hopeful. What can we tell our progressive friends out there? Yeah, I, I would say... feel th hopeful about all this. <laughs> I think the hopeful thing is more and more progressives are choosing to delve into some of the long-term structural causes of these things. Uh, seeing Bernie Sanders out there uh, being so popular is tremendously hopeful. He's talking about some of the real important factors driving increased inequality. When I go talk to my environmental friends about population issues or other issues, they're much more interested now than they were 10 years ago at looking at some of these underlying factors. So I think, I think intellectually we're moving in the right direction. Hopefully that'll translate into political change relatively soon. Well, thank you to all of you who uh, have tuned in. Uh, you. You know, we gave you the link on how to get the book. Uh, we've given you the link how to get uh, uh, Ann Coulter's book. And uh, boy, what a what bookends we have for our summer, the beginning <laughs> and the end of the summer. And and uh, except for a couple of things, uh, the the uh, the recommendations are almost that's that's the, in the end the recommendations are almost the same, even though the reasons are often somewhat different. Maybe maybe that's a, a hopeful sign that maybe the so. populace on the left and the right. Uh, can can drive this thing again. Thanks a lot. We'll be uh, we'll be emailing you soon. <laughs>